Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us today for our first Tea with the Trustee of 2022. I'm Sarah Brennan, a professional trustee at Dariada Trustees, and I've been a trustee for nearly nine years now. Um, before that, I've got about 10 years experience in pensions consultancy and administration. And whilst I might be based in Manchester, I'm a true Yorkshire lass at heart, so appropriately, I've brought with me today a massive Yorkshire tea mug filled with Yorkshire tea. So I hope a few of you have got a, a similar drink with you. So I brought today with me three people. One of them you can just see a photo of, which is Susan McFarlane. She's one of my colleagues and she's in the background to rescue us should we have any IT difficulties. Um, but I've brought two people that you can see on screen who are here today to join the conversation with me about relevant considerations when setting your cash commutation factors. So we can't hear or see you, but if you do have any questions, please feel free to pop them in the Q&A box. I think you'll find that at the bottom of your screen. And we have allowed a little bit of time at the end of the session for Q&As. So if we don't get to them during the session, we'll try our very best to pick them up offline and get back to you. So we have received a few questions before the session and they're largely about what makes a commutation factor reasonable and how the basis for transfer values compares to the assumptions for cash factors. And we think our discussions today cover, cover off these points, but by all means do get back in touch with us if you need any further clarity. So I'm just going to hand you over briefly to Amanda Bannister and Matt Masters, who's going to introduce themselves. Thanks very much, Sarah, and uh, good afternoon all. I'm Amanda Bannister and I'm a colleague of Sarah's at Dariada Trustees. I joined Dariada last year, having spent um, about 20 years or so as a pensions lawyer, latterly as a partner at DWF. And I've joined the conversation today because I've had cause to consider this issue quite carefully on a few of my schemes, both as a lawyer and more recently as a professional trustee. Now, I can't claim Sarah's Yorkshire credentials, despite having been an adoptive Sheffielder for about 13 years or so. So I will be drinking strawberry tea, which doubles up as a lovely potpourri. Um, afternoon. I'm Matt Masters. I'm an actuary at Spence and Partners, and I'm delighted to be here to give an actuary's perspective on the discussion. I've been an actuary for over 20 years. I've spoken on cash commutation factors at a number of conferences in the past and was one of over 60 actuaries who took part in the 2020 Institute of Actuaries thematic review, which looked at actuarial factors. Out of the office, I like game shows and have secretly harboured an ambition to appear on one. Thank you very much both. So to kick things off today, we're going to start with a little game show of the much loved game, Bruce Forsyth, play your cards right. Uh, Matt's going to play Bruce today. Uh, we thought that he could pull it off better than me. Uh, disappointed that he's not got his Brucey tash on, but I see he's got his best attire on today. Amanda and I are going to be the contestants and we're going to try to guess if Bruce's next card is going to be higher or lower. And the aim's going to be the one who can reach the end card. Now, sadly, I don't think we've agreed on any Brucey bonuses today. So I think it's just going to be a case of who avoids any embarrassment of not winning. So over to you, Bruce. Thanks, Sarah. Um, now, I'm the leader of the pack, which makes me such a lucky jack. Although I'm not lucky enough to have anyone deal the cards for me today or even a board to put the cards on. But I do have seven cards, each with a year and the typical cash commutation factor for that year on. And that's for a male at age 65 with a level pension. Now, we flipped a virtual coin before we started hasn't been independently verified. Um, and Amanda will go first to try and make it to the end for the big points. Mm -hmm. And you'll all remember what points make. I know you know, that's right, prizes. So Amanda, there's no stick or twist in our game. Yes, we adapted the rules a, a bit, but here's your first card. So 2006, so in 2006, typical cash commutation factor was 12 to one. Um, and the question is, 2017, higher or lower? 
Oh, right. Um, can I ask the audience? Oh, no, I can't hear them. Um, right. Uh, I'm going to say higher. Higher than the 12, you say? 17. Mm. So... 1995 was a typical cash commutation factor higher or lower than 17 to 1. 1995. Um, I can tell you what was Christmas number one, controversially, Michael Jackson's Earth Song. No, that's not what you want. No. OK, 1995. Um, uh, I'm going to say lower, lower. Lower than a 17, you say? 11. 1970. Are you suggesting I was born in 1970, Matt? Outrageous. Right, going from 1995 all the way back to 1970. Um, I'm going to go lower. Lower than an 11, you say? Nine to one. 1985. Right, 1970 to 1985. I'm spotting a bit of a pattern here. So I'm going to go higher. Higher than a nine, you say? Yeah. Oh, oh. you're wrong. It's the same. No. And you don't get anything for a pair. Not in this game. So it's over to Sarah for a chance to steal it. So was the typical factor in... 2012, higher or lower than nine to one? Well, I'm going to continue with Amanda's pattern and I'm going to go higher. Higher than a nine, you say? 14. And the final card, this for the win, 2023. Oh, that's interesting. Well, I've... Uh... I've not brought my crystal ball with me today, but let's go higher. Higher than the 14, you say? 20. Didn't they do well? Well, not so much Amanda. And I would say well done to Sarah had it not been completely staged. Thank you very much, Bruce and Amanda. And yes, I don't often win at games unless the stage, so it's a, a first for me today. Um, but the purpose of that little game is to show you that if you if you put the, the cards in date order, cash factors have more than doubled in the last 50 years. And that's primarily due to people living longer and the change in market conditions lowering the expected future returns. So I wonder, Matt, can, can you expand on those points for us? Yeah, sure. Um, so in the 1970s, as you'll no doubt remember, Amanda, um, HMRC rules imposed maximum commutation rates of 9 to 1 for males and 11 to 1 for females at age 65. And at that time, members were expected to live perhaps 15 years in retirement, pensions were level in payment, and there was double-digit interest rates and inflation. Then what? Well, HMRC, who didn't want members getting too much tax-free cash, deterred trustees from improving factors, effectively anchoring them back to 1970s conditions. Subsequently, as market conditions worsened and pension surpluses disappeared in the 1990s, so did the willingness to take action that could increase costs. So now, by contrast, that same member who we mentioned in the 1970s is expected to live perhaps 25 years in retirement, will have at least half his pension in increasing in payment, and interest rates are near record lows. So to bring it bang up to the present day, we have comparable PPF factors of 19.3 to 1. And those factors are designed to be actuarially equivalent on the PPF's low risk basis, because that's what the legislation requires of the PPF. Mm, and you, you raise a really good point there, Matt. The starting point should be the overriding requirement. And for trustees, this means looking at what the rules of their scheme say. Actuarial equivalence may or may not be what's required in the rules. 
across the schemes I work on, there's probably no more than two schemes with exactly the same wording. So it's really important to check what your rules say, make sure you understand what they mean, and then do what they say. The Institute of Actuaries thematic review that Matt mentioned earlier showed that about 90% of schemes that took part in that survey required trustees to take actuarial advice. The two most popular phrases are slightly different, with one saying factors are set by the trustees normally having received actuarial advice, with the other one being set by the trustees but certified as reasonable by the actuary. So the rules are the key starting point when setting your factors, but let's drill down a little bit more. If the rules refer to actuarial equivalence only, then there's clearly no scope to include non-actuarial considerations. But what considerations might we take into account if the rules provide for the trustees to take, uh, sorry, the trustees or the actuary to decide what's reasonable? Amanda, I wonder if you could talk us through that. Sure. Um, well, I think it's fair to say it's something that we've seen quite different views on from advisors. Um, there are certainly a lot of factors that might be considered. Um, so we've just looked to list the ones that we've seen suggested on a slide that Susan will just flash up for us for a little while. But are these all relevant considerations if you're looking to set a, what's, um, what's deemed a reasonable uh, commutation factor? So starting with the obvious ones, clearly the actuarial value of the benefit being exchanged is a key factor. And assessing that, we'll look uh, to include the usual factors, things like mortality, and investment returns that are expected, but also how the benefit is made up. At what rate does it increase? And at what age would it start to be paid? The next most obvious ones might be funding and covenant. And I think these probably are relevant in the context of that sort of rule. And as is often the case, they're probably also linked so, for example, if the scheme is poorly funded, but with a super strong covenant, then you might think twice about whether it's right to reduce a cash computation factor to take the funding level into account. In our experience, though, um, this discussion usually lands or quite often lands uh, on not reducing for underfunding exactly, but equally not allowing for any prudence in the basis of calculation. So you might end up saying that you'll give actuarial equivalents, but on a best estimate type basis. So moving beyond that, we thought it might be interesting to look at a few of the considerations over, with what, over which there might be a bit more debate as to whether they're relevant for the trustees or the actuary. So Sarah, do you fancy engaging in some spirited debate, which obviously isn't staged? On well, then. So shall we look at the fact that it's tax free, that it's a member option, and how about market practice? Great choices, Sarah. Yeah, let's look at those. So um, looking at the fact that it's, uh, it's a tax free benefit, is that relevant, do you think? Well, I, th I think that must be relevant. Uh, I mean, the trustees, they're required to find a balance between the interests of the individual member and the scheme as a whole. Um, so I don't see why the scheme shouldn't share in some of the benefit of, of the tax advantage. Yeah, well, hang on a minute, though. Isn't the tax-free nature really a matter between the member and HMRC and intended to be a benefit for the member rather than the scheme? Well also, from a practical perspective, I slightly wonder how taking tax into account will generate a uniform set of factors for all members, because the rate of income tax a member might pay on his pension will vary from member to member. OK, yeah, I, I see your point there. What about the fact that it's a member option? Yeah, that's an interesting one. I guess it's entirely their choice. So the member doesn't have to take the lump sum perfectly entitled to take the pension instead. So surely the scheme should just be able to set the factors it wants to and let the member decide? That would be reasonable, wouldn't it? Well, I don't know. I'm, I'm not too sure on that one. Ultimately, the question we're really asking 
is if the fact that the member does have to commute his pension, something that can be used to justify a lower factor that's not value for money. And when you put it like that, it's hard to see much justification for it being uh, relevant in setting a reasonable factor. And in light of the trustees' fiduciary duties to the members, it's really difficult to see what the point of including the word reasonable would be if it's fine really to set any factor on the basis that the member doesn't have to take it. Yeah, that's a good point. Oh, I think we might have lost Amanda there. Are you Amanda? So I think Amanda was was gonna the third one you mentioned, Sarah, was market practice. Um, and are the stats that are produced by the various bodies any help in deciding on your scheme's factors? Uh, okay, and I think, Amanda, we've unfortunately li li lost there. But um, the, the last point I was just going to cover off was about um, taking into account market practice um, and, and, and what degree you should take that into account. Uh, I mean, I personally take a lot of comfort from looking at my own portfolio of clients and my own experience and that of my colleagues and the schemes that we work on. What do you think about playing, playing Amanda's card with the trustee hat on, if you, if you wouldn't mind? Yeah, no, I, I agree. I can see that you can take comfort from that, but I think there's a lot of care that you need to take around that. So the danger in just looking at stats comes back to the point I made earlier, that what the rules require is paramount, and that varies from schemes. So if the stats are amalgamated, they're likely to include schemes whose rules are very different from your own. So you're likely to have schemes where factors might be fixed in the rules. It might be specified at 12 to 1. And um, certainly common in some public sector schemes, which provide a separate lump sum only. Um, so as with any statistics, they can give a misleading picture. And if you're looking to answer what's right for your scheme. Um... Uh, so I think that means that we're, we're, we're both right on that one. And that was a really good debate. Um, I mean, of, of course, anything in trustee decision making, it's about, about following the process. Uh, and the key really is to know what's what's your power, what's in the rule and what relevant considerations you should be taking into account. Uh, but thank you there and apologies, we have lost Amanda. Um, I'll just carry, carry on uh, if Amanda joins as we can pick up. Um, failing to understand and follow the rules, though, that's one of the two main things we've seen go wrong in this area. So, for example, we were appointed on one scheme uh, where the previous trustees and advisors thought that the factors were hard coded. So they were never changed and continued to be at the rate set when the scheme was set up in the late 80s. And we all know what that rate was from, from Bruce's earlier cards. So when we took legal advice on the matter, it was confirmed, as we had thought, that the power to set the factors that was actually with the trustees. So the other area we're going to um, that we see going wrong uh, and leading to similar results uh, as it happened is inertia, which I'll just talk a little bit about now. So the thematic review mentioned earlier says every three years should be the maximum time difference for review of your factors, but that this should not be the default. We would suggest that trustees build this into their business plans and risk registers um, when they will review the factors and to also ensure that they have a mechanism to highlight any changes and circumstances that would really warrant a, a factor review. So we've had a bit of a debate about some of the considerations, but one area that we've not really touched on is how cash factors compare to transfer values. And both are options for members, albeit a member only has the option of the cash when they're of retirement age. But as a trustee, it's important to make sure you're offering fair value to the member for both options. So I wonder, Matt, can you talk us through 
whether cash commutation factors should be equivalent to transfer values? Yeah, it's a great question because there's a public interest. Uh, because they're both areas where an actuary can have an upfront and immediate impact on an individual. And indeed, following the introduction of pension freedoms, there was certainly an expectation that commutation and TV terms would become much closer. That was the view of the FCA. So the short answer. Um, so if you start from the position that transfer values are derived correctly, and if the requirements around how commutation factors should be derived were the same, then they should be equivalent. But even then, there would still be a difference in the headline rate. So for example, a transfer value also converts the spouse's pension, whereas a cash commutation factor doesn't. Now, in practice, they are subject to different requirements. So while a transfer value must represent at least the best estimate of the cost of providing benefits within the scheme, commutation rates have no such official rules other than what's said in the scheme documents. So at the moment, there's no requirement for them to be equivalent. If you two were to ask for my personal view, I think I'd say it would be helpful if they were closer than they currently are. Um, and welcome back, Amanda. <laughs> Thanks very much, Matt. I think I completely lost network. <laughs> Slightly inopportune timing. So embarrassed that you lost the game. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I just couldn't take it. <laughs> You've just joined us at the, the Q&A, so uh, just my thanks to Matt for, for talking us through those couple of points. That was really helpful. And if you just bear with me, I'm just going to check to see if we've got any Q and A's in for us to, to have a look at. If you just bear with me uh, getting closer to the screen to check. Apologies for the up closeness. Okay, dope. So um, this is a, an interesting question here that we've got, uh, it's asking, I think the gist of it is whether we should be suggesting that members take financial advice if their PCLS is more than £30,000. And I, I think I'll, I'll give my view on, on that first of all. And I think that's really a, a really good question and definitely something I think that should be considered. Uh, we know that there's regulatory guidance for the for financial advice to be taken for CETVs above that amount. So in my view, it makes sense to, to do that for any benefit um, that the member's taking from the scheme, whether that's a PCLS or a, a CETV, because it's, it's important that they have the right information and the right guidance to support the decision that they're going to make. Have you got anything else to add to that, Matt? Uh, no, I'd, I'd absolutely agree. I think whether to take a pension commencement lump sum is probably one of the single largest financial decisions that most members will ever have to make. Um, you know, if advice is required, if a TV is more than £30,000, why wouldn't you do likewise for, for commutation? So it makes absolute sense to me, yes. Mm. No, definitely food for thought, that one. And let's have a look here. Uh, this is a good one, and it, it might be one for you, Matt. Uh, it's a really interesting one. So what level would raise a red flag? And I think that's referring to the cash commutation factor. So what cash commutation factor would give cause for concern, do you reckon? OK, well, so to, to pick up on your earlier point about taking comfort from the experience you know, that you see elsewhere, um, by way of reference, I'm going to refer to the thematic review because um, that showed that half of cash commutation factors for males at age 65 were between 16 and 20 to 1. So cutting to the chase, I'm going to say that if your cash commutation factor at age 65 is under 15 to 1, then it's worth looking at. Hmm. Interesting point there, Matt. Thank you very much. Right, I'm just going to have a final look for Q and A's. And I can't see any coming through and we're on 
five to four so we might be able to finish a little bit early and you can all have an extra five minutes of your of your day back um so with that i just thought we'd take a a few takeaways from us um, for our session and they'd be to ensure you follow and document the correct process when setting your factors, take advice when you need it and consider when you'll review your factors and build this into your business plans. So thank you very much for listening to us today. Apologies for the slight hiccup with the, the IT. Um, I do want to say that was on purpose, Amanda. Um, apologies for the puns. It was quite fun pulling this together to have a bit of a, of a theme there. Um, but as always, we'd love to hear any feedback from you on the content that we've covered today or the format of it all. Appreciate you all probably listen to thousands of, of webinars so any suggestions for future ones would be very much welcome other than that i think i'm just going to hand back to bruce for one one final word it was nice to see you to see you nice amanda's on mute <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank Thanks you. So. Bye.